Uh, good evening, everybody, and I hope you're sitting comfortably. Um, I know that this was broadcast around screening tools and a reflection on different screening tools. I'm going to talk a little bit around, um, I suppose, screening assessment, but really thinking about overlapping difficulties and how that affects maybe young people in yachts and why this complexity, um, I think Aaron was just mentioning the complexity around or, or uh, Katrina around speech and language and dyslexia and the challenge of that and somebody else talking about visual stress. I'm going to talk about the, what the evidence is for this overlap and why this is a bit of a challenge for us all at the moment and then come up with some um, constructive uh, suggestions. Let me just introduce myself to start with. Um, chef's hat is um, I'm a parent. Uh, sometimes I feel like a, a, sort of a driver, a parent, a, a bottle washer, um, multi-hatted as a parent. I'm a parent of a, um, a, a three children, and my middle child has dyslexia, dyspraxia, and ADHD. So I come with um, parental experience of uh, learning difficulties, personal ones of living with somebody. My husband's got dyslexia as well. Um, I'm a, I've got a chair in developmental disorders in education, so I'm sort of halfway house between um, in education as well. And I'm a medic, I'm a doctor, I was a GP formerly before I got into the field of developmental disorders and worked in psychiatry. So I'm a three or several head headed animal. Um, what's my session this evening? Well, really to talk a little bit about specific learning difficulties and developmental disorders and how they overlap. I think that's really important because when you're seeing somebody in a youth offending setting, they don't come neatly labelled. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges around that and what the evidence is for overlap and how do they all overlap. And then really think about how we can measure this and then talk about the relevance to um, youth offending. Okay, so off we go. And really, yes, if you've got any questions, write them down and we'll try and I'll answer as many as I possibly can for the end of the session, if that's possible. Let's start off with, though, the real the challenge between really having this label wars, really, that different children, young people, um, adolescents and adults are labeled with different labels and they have different, and we use these terms in different ways. And this is a real challenge because we're not using consistent language when we're describing um, individuals who might have additional learning needs of one sort or another. Now what we know is, and I suppose this is a very simplistic statement, but it's, never, it's always true, is that everyone is different and unique. And then what you might find is one young person has got a reading and coordination problem, somebody else has got reading, spelling and attention, somebody else has got reading and understanding, some just spelling and speaking. And actually it's quite random in some ways about what label that somebody ends up getting. It might be the path where they go through, it might be the parents and whether they're aware that this is a challenge for their, um, their son or daughter, that if they've had similar experiences they may not recognise that this is a challenge that could be actually intervened and helped. And then we sometimes see individuals who have some of those learning difficulties, but also we, what we see is a variety of behaviours. So what we might see as a consequence of maybe not understanding the words on the page, not understanding instructions being given to you orally, um, that somebody becomes quite withdrawn, angry or aggressive, they might avoid eye contact, they might become the class clown or a joker, they might outwardly be overconfident, or they might withdraw within themselves and become rather depressed or anxious. So actually what you might see on the surface is not these symptoms, because you're not looking for them necessarily, but what we might see is these symptoms and signs. And if you can imagine somebody might have a specific language impairment that under, doesn't understand or decode information very well, that going to, into school might have been very difficult times for them because they haven't picked up all the nuances of language in the classroom, they haven't decoded all the information that's been said to them, they've misunderstood instructions, got into trouble, and then got quite defensive or angry because they tried their best and then this is what happened. So what you might see is these symptoms. And sometimes we see these symptoms, we don't dig underneath and go, but why might somebody be withdrawn? Why might somebody be um, overconfident despite, or the class clown, despite them seemingly have challenges on paper or whatever? So I think this is important that we sometimes misconstrue behavior. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later this evening. 
So let's take three young people. These uh, might be three young people that you see in your yachts. And they're sitting there. And they're there, and they are not looking around and not really attending. One's fallen asleep. One can't be bothered. And we can make assumptions about seeing these young people. Um, and we often make value judgments about that just based on what we're seeing. Now, this evening, I can't see you, so, and you can't see me. So you could hear my voice and make a judgment about who I am and what I look like. We all often look at people and make judgments about what we're seeing based on what we're seeing now of these three young men. So what are you doing now at this moment? You're, you're hopefully listening to me and you haven't fallen asleep on your computer. But the, the, in, in reality, that what we do whenever we're reading a book or we're listening to somebody, we're not doing something in isolation. So when we're reading a book, we're holding it. We're still sitting on the chair. We're, our eyes are looking at the page. We might be cutting out the sounds of other people around us. So our actions are not done in isolation. So it's interesting that we often look at learning difficulties still in this sort of sense of isolation. So what I want to do is tell you a tale of two stories with two potentially different endings. And I think this is important because if we could change the endings, that might be a happier end to the story. So the first one is not a great ending. This is a young person, one of those three guys sitting at the table, who has got some reading difficulties, who's inattentive and very fidgety, finds it difficult. He gets up and he wanders around in the classroom and he finds it very difficult to start to stay on task. Um, and he annoys the other kids and young people around him. And he gets in trouble, so he gets kicked out of class. And then he, what he ends up doing is he gets excluded from school because of his behavior. And he ends up behind the back of the bike sheds. And who's he going to meet around the back of the bike sheds? He's going to meet other young people who've been excluded as well. He gets sent to a pupil referral unit and uh, seems to be doing quite well all there, goes back into school, gets excluded again, and then ends up, sadly, in, within the criminal justice system. OK, so that's one person. Let's take a, a different end. You've got an individual who, another chap who's sitting there, or a girl who's sitting there, and he's been, uh, or she's been identified as having speech and language delay quite early on, and was picked up, and somebody very smart recognized that this was important to intervene because of the relationship between language delay and dyslexia. He was then identified as having dyslexia and given the right and appropriate support for his pattern of strengths and difficulties and off he went to further education and into employment. Two different individuals, two different pathways with two different endings. But both could have ended with a good ending. And at the moment what we see is we have this sort of lottery. And quite often we don't really know where some one young person will end. We're not very good at predicting outcomes. We're not very good at predicting whether somebody has an early language delay whether they will go on to develop literacy difficulties, they're at greater risk of having dyslexia type difficulties, or whether they'll be picked up because they've got, they're fed up, they can't read, they can't understand, and they have to go to school every day, and they still don't understand what's on the page or what somebody's been say, saying to them, and they end up going down the behavior route. So I want to unpack some of this. So this is like spillicans, so you don't quite know what, what's going to happen. And so there are crucial factors in success or failure. I suppose one is when the young people are recognized, so the literacy intervention and other support can be put in place. If this is early enough and is appropriate and adequate, two very important words, appropriate and adequate, support is put in place, this can make a massive difference. If they're given a misdiagnosis, which I'm going to spend a little time this evening explaining why that happens, they could be seen as behavior and not their underlying issues, why they're behaving. They could end up going down the wrong path. Lots of people doing the right thing, but to the wrong, the wrong children or young people in the wrong way. Good practice, but not being directed in the right way. They could be missed, and I'm going to show you some evidence of that in the criminal justice system as well. So they could have left school early, or they could have been excluded from school. 
They might be missed because in a family where everybody's got literacy difficulties, well, we all can't read very well in our family, so Joe or Janet's just the same as the rest of us. So there might be an acceptance, this is what we expect. And so no aspiration of this could be better for all of us. So where does it all start? Um, I'd like to say A to B in a straight line, but unfortunately it's not quite straight at the moment. I think the first thing is confusion of bounds regarding terminology. This is really a really problematic across all the neurodevelopmental disorders, not just dyslexia, and probably dyslexia is defined a little bit better than many of the others. Now, diagnostic, why do we have these diagnostic boxes? Well, we get labels because if you have it, you get it for service provision. We have labels because they're descriptors. So I can tell you what my problem is, and it's a shortcut description for you to understand, oh, right, OK, I sort of know that, so now I know what to do about it. Um, we use labels because that's a sort of medical model system against a social model which looks like really about um, society disabling us. And so the label doesn't reside within the individual, it resides within society. And then we have ecological models, which says this is more complex than just somebody having a difficulty or disability. It does depend on a number of other factors as well. So we use different names used in lots of different ways. And I highlight the blue here just to show some of the different terms that are being used. And this is changing terminology all the time. And to each of us around the table this evening, we will have different understanding of what these terms mean. And this is a real problem. And I'm going to give you a link to a paper at the end of it where we put, to, to put a review, particularly in the criminal justice system, about the real discrepancy in terms of definitions around these things. But this is across the board in education as well. So specific learning difficulties. Well, they're not very specific, as I'm going to show you. Learning difficulties, learning disabilities. In some areas, this means people with an intellectual impairment. And others, it means something in learning disabilities in America means often reading disorders or dyslexia. Learning difficulties and disabilities, hidden impairments, non-visible conditions, developmental disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, neurodiversity or neuroatypical. So these are, I'm sure if you talk to your colleagues, you will see that we're using these in different ways. When I'm talking about this umbrella this evening, I'm generally talking around dyslexia, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, I've missed one out, specific language impairments, developmental coordination disorder or dyspraxia, motor difficulties, and dyscalculia number difficulties. And I'm putting these all under that umbrella. Some would include them, some wouldn't include them. The reason I am will become apparent why I put all of these underneath. So, when we talk about dyslexia and specific language impairment, even behavior or ADHD, these are terms that are descriptors. And they are variable. Under each one of those umbrella will be variability of that individual with that diagnosis. So that two people with the same diagnosis will have quite different patterns of strengths and challenges. And that's really important because sometimes we go, oh, we know what to do with but actually each of us has got an individual pattern. It becomes more complex, as I'll show you. And dyslexia, generally people have reading and spelling and writing and sometimes understanding difficulties and specific language impairment. Individuals might have receptive, understanding, expressive, difficulties with articulation. Different people will have different of challenges underneath there. And ADHD, they might have difficulties with focusing and attending and organizing, hyperactivity, impulsivity. These are the things that are usually associated with this. Can you all hear OK? So just this, suddenly there's a bit of crackle here. Everything OK? I shall carry on. Yeah. Hi, is the, is the sound okay?
just checking the sounds okay. Yeah. So, I can still hear you, I can do, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. yeah it's right, gone, fine, okay. It's gone out, yes. Everyone's put their hand up, it's working fine, yes. Fine, so you, you okay. Ca okay. Carry on, Amanda, just thank carry you. Carry on. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry about that because it sound went a bit crackly and didn't want to carry on without everybody hearing. Okay. So let's move on from this. So we're talking about how somebody gets a diagnosis or not. And, what they, and how frequently they get a diagnosis. Well, what we do is we apply cutoffs for tests and say, if you have it and you score a something below here, you have it. And if you score above here, you don't have it. Now, the problem with that is that this, most of the diagnoses are on a continuum, that dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, specific language impairment is on a continuum. So if you've got to score on some test here, it doesn't mean you don't have difficulties, it's just that the cutoff, you've gone above the cutoff. It isn't like going to somebody and having an assessment, and because you've had the assessment, everything's been solved, so you no longer have a difficulty. So we, we apply cutoffs about who and isn't included in certain diagnoses. What we also know is that some labels are better than others. We talk about famous people with a gift of dyslexia, and I think this is a very positive because it's saying that we've all got strengths, which is absolutely true. Famous people with autism, and we're recognizing that, that certain patterns of intellectual ability come with benefits, and if we harness those benefits, society would be a better place. Famous people with dyspraxia, we're a bit short on those in terms of that list of individuals, and we need to have more famous people coming forward. Daniel Radcliffe came sort of out and declared that he had dyspraxia, and then we've not really heard very much from him since then. He sort of jumped back in. And famous people with ADHD, there are lists like that. However, what we know is that um, there is a labeling bias, and it's much better for, in society. Still, people sort of go, I'd rather have dyslexia than I would have ADHD, because some labels don't seem to be as good to have because there is a sort of negative connotation attached to them where it shouldn't be. Um, if you've got a NEAT, there is a sort of negative perception. Or ADHD, I think, still has a stigma attached to it, even though 1% of individuals will have severe ADHD in the population. Okay, so let's go back to my three guys sitting in class. One's got a spelling problem. One's looking irritable and bored, and the other one's withdrawn and actually fallen asleep. But if we find out a little bit more about them, we find out that this is just one aspect of who they are. The guy with dyslexia has got low self-esteem and he's feeling a bit lonely. The angry one is feeling angry because he doesn't understand what's been asked of him. And the one who's feeling very tired and pretty low as well is, uh, been, had been bullied and he's got writing difficulties and he's struggling to get things down in class so he doesn't want to write anything anymore. And we add a little bit more. He's quite fidgety. He's finding it very difficult to sit still. The other one doesn't like change. And so he's worried about the next class because the teacher might, another teacher might teach in a different way and he won't understand that as well. And so he's getting worried and anxious about that. And the, the guy who's got dyslexia has problems with spelling, he can't copy off the board and he's feeling very anxious and nervous. So as we explore a bit more, what we see beneath those faces that were faceless, we start to understand that. But if we only capture, say, a spelling assessment, we won't capture these things about this individual. If we only capture writing difficulties, we won't understand some of those other things that often overlap and are commonly present. And then we add a bit more, we understand about the social aspects of somebody's life, which actually could be the reason why they're behaving on that day. And this is why it's really important to have a sort of ecological approach. This guy's worried and lonely, he's got all of those things, and his dad's really ill. This one is really, he's feeling low and he hasn't slept last night because he's really tired because he's worried he's got a sports day soon and he's got coordination difficulties, he's worried how he's going to do in the sports day and he's not sleeping well at all and that's why he's really tired when he's gone to school this morning. What we know is that individuals with specific learning difficulties can often have mental health and well-being difficulties as well and these things are often present and it's not really a surprise that actually that the signs and symptoms of any one of the specific learning difficulties will vary from person to person. 
and they'll, on a severity, they'll go from what is mild in inverted commas, I mean mild impacting less on day-to-day -day function to severe having a major impact on everyday function and living. And I think it's really important that we're understanding that individual and you're working in a yacht setting that you really take on board. This is um, Yuri Bronfenbrenner who set up this system, uh, designed this ecological system. But in, in a yacht, it's really important to understand the other factors that might be affecting that individual in the middle. And this might be the other, in, the other young people that are in the yacht with them, that are the, their family setting, where they're living, their neighborhood, what support systems are around them where they're living, what peers and friendship groups they've got, what's going on in the government and education system to provide support for them, what's happening previously that might have an effect on them today, what's happening in the future that might be having an effect on today. And really think about these interacting factors that might have different effects for one young person to another young person. And really when you make your formulation a person-centered approach, really that's what we've got to do. We can't make a formula for an individual and say this is the sport they need without taking these things in, in, in um, context as well. Now what the reality is the diagnosis or label an individual gets is dependent on the door they go through and we've done quite a lot of research in this in the last few years showing that there are real diagnostic biases occurring. What happens is we see things from different perspectives. Now I can see a cow here but some of you will not be able to see it. Even though I'm telling you it's a cow, even though I'm showing it's a cow, you will still find it different to see and maybe difficult to see. This doesn't say that you've got an intellectual impairment, but if I kept saying, really, you can't see it's a cow? And some of you now really still can't see it's a cow, you're going to feel embarrassed or worried or concerned or anxious. Here's the cow's ears, here's an eyes. Here's the ears and this is the nose. Some people think this looks like a map. This is the head of the cow. The point is that just because I show someone, just because I tell them, just because I point it out, it's not an intellectual exercise, This doesn't mean, but it does mean that you have to deliver information in many different sort of ways to get all of you to see the same thing and get the same messages across. So what we know is that these diagnostic um, uh, biases are really related to the training and background and experiences. What you've been taught, what your toolkit is, it's a bit like looking at an elephant. You will look at the elephant in different ways. One of you will see it as a wall, another will see it as a rope, somebody sees it as a tree. Depending on your theoretical background, it's a bit like a plumber and electrician looking at your house and seeing why the lights aren't working. One will look at the pipework because it might have got wet, an electrician might look at the wiring and they won't look at each other's parts, and that's exactly what happens. So the door you go through then ends up, the diagnosis and the assessments you're getting might end up with one diagnosis or another. So depending on your theoretical uh, training and your toolkit, if I say that the symptoms are the person is the animal I'm going to be talking to you about is black and white, it's got a head and two eyes, depending on your theoretical uh, upbringing and your training, you might come up with three possible solutions. So the way we learn, understand, and behave varies for every individual. Therefore, the challenges aren't in neat boxes. So the young people coming through your yacht, if you're thinking about screening, you really need to be thinking across specific learning difficulties and not in silos. And the reason for this is our brains don't function in compartments. They're not color-coded like this. It would be lovely if they were, if I could just sort of go the red bits and the pink bits, but it's not quite so true. And this is actually what our wiring looks like in our brains. And it's complex, and it's interconnected, and it's messy, and much more like the M25. And we're really all shades of gray. Which one best describes you? Do you want to read these four statements? And then have a think about which one you're most like. Now, in reality, I'm going to give you a second to do so. So in reality, you might be a bit of this and a bit of that, or a bit of this and a bit of that, or a bit of this and a bit of that, or a bit of this and a bit of that, or a bit of all four, or a bit of all three. 
the reality is what I've done is used dyslexia, dys, uh, uh, really crude dyslexia descriptors, dyspraxia descriptors, um, uh, autism spectrum descriptors, and ADHD descriptors. It doesn't mean that you've got it if you've got those symptoms, but what I'm showing you is that actually we don't fall into these neat boxes. In reality, we don't. And I'm going to show you some explanations and some evidence for that now. But what we like to do is to box and label so we have a common language. And we've done this historically for many years because it was a way of having a shortcut descriptor. But what we did, instead of saying reading difficulties, coordination difficulties, social difficulties, attention difficulties, we attached these descriptors, dyslexia, dyspraxia, or DCD, which is the, more, the international term. But what actually happens is sometimes we mislabel and put people into the wrong boxes. So we might mislabel them and see they can't be bothered, or they're lazy, or we don't think they're very able, or they're not trying, like those kids we saw at the front end of the, the talk. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about evidence of overlapping patterns. And reality is, and each one of these arrows in this, in this slide represents uh, papers demonstrating this overlap. And this is oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder and ADHD and anxiety. Oh, let me go back. Autism spectrum disorder, developmental coordination disorder, dyslexia, specific language impairment. Every single one of these. And I ran out of time and arrows because actually every single paper, I could find more papers to show this relevance in, in two ways as well. Okay? And I'm going to show you a bit of this research. So this lottery going with literacy, language, and behavior really we see that there's lots of evidence for this overlap with specific learning difficulties. And it's not really specific at all. And the pure child is a rare child, or a pure young person is a rare one that just has purely just one. And we recognize, and I heard that Maggie Snowling is going to be talking at one of the conferences, who's an excellent speaker and hugely knowledgeable in this field, and has done a lot of the work with Dorothy Bishop over many of the years, really recognizing that specific language impairments and dyslexia are on a continuum. And many children diagnosed with specific language impairment are also dyslexic and vice versa. And this is really accepted practice now. So 50% of those with SLI will have dyslexia and vice versa. So this is really important that if you have a young person who has dyslexia, you really need to be thinking about do they have specific language impairment and vice versa. And this is from uh, Maggie Snowling's paper back in 2004, which was really important because it's one of the first times where this was really being acknowledged, that, that these are not separate um, diagnostic categories in the sense that there is real blurring at the edges. Now, this was just a small piece of work I did a few years ago, taking 14 children from the pupil referral unit, and we looked at the level of other specific learning difficulties in this group, and eight out of the 14 had language disorders and four of them had dyslexia. So this was very important that actually in this group of individuals in the PRU where their mean reading age, this is the age, the chronological age is the blue bar, so this is how old they actually were, and these are indications of each of the young people. So you can see that for many of them, their chronological age was way ahead of their reading and spelling ages, and the mean reading age that fall about four and a half years behind their chronological age. These young people were, had been excluded, and then they were sent to the pupil referral unit for a period of time, that their reading age was substantially below the, 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 what they should for their years. And at the time, these young people were going there for about six weeks. And the PRU was doing, a, the, was doing a really good job, and they were really improving greatly. But then they went back into school, but they hadn't gained. There was still this disparity. And often in the secondary school, they were still being given work with a, a reading information that might have been for an age for, of their chronological age, yet they couldn't access it because they were at least four years behind. So if they're given reading material of an age 12, but they were reading at age 8, you can imagine why they would become frustrated. And so this is so important that we recognize it. So what do we do? Do we see the behavior, but we, do we look beneath it? And that's really the question. And what's the impact if we don't do this? Well, we could have misinterpretation, the young people could be missed, they could be misdiagnosed, or they could be misunderstood, or not a good result. Misdiagnosis, an example of that is that um, some work by Lance a few years ago, but other people have done similar work, 
the young people seen as conduct disorder or having mental health problems when actually they have speech communication language needs. So there is good evidence that children may misdiagnose as having conduct or mental health problems when in fact they do have speech and language problems. So here's one of our lads at the desk again. That actually children, teachers see, when they see um, a child with fidgety behavior, they attribute that often to ADHD and they'll overrate it uh, even when the student has language impairment and reading difficulties. So they'll look at the behavior first and won't think that actually ADHD often, uh, in a lot of cases, coexists with speech and language difficulties and reading disabilities or dyslexia as well. So see behavior and believe behavior. And really this was a recent paper looking at the low level of social and emotional conflict that we see from typically developing, this is children and young people who don't have um, difficulties those having speech and language impairment, those having ADHD, just showing the social and emotional impact in the study really was showing those with ADHD have the most uh, social and emotional conflict. But this was a continuum. It wasn't black or white and showing this behavioral profiles. And, and I think this is really important. This stuff is not black or white. Um, for a long time, we've seen this association between speech and language impairment and ADHD and showing that there's high levels of overlap between the two. Again, with literacy difficulties, uh, Morris Place's uh, study in 2000, looking at young people in a PRU and showing high levels of reading difficulties. And then other um, papers looking at earlier reading difficulties, reporting increased risk of behavioral problems in middle childhood. So where are we going with this? That actually, by identifying, if you see somebody coming along that has reading difficulties, or attention difficulties, or language difficulties, or motor difficulties, or behavioral difficulties, or what we need to do is stop and say, often those other conditions are very common. And what you will see is they may not meet the criteria to get a diagnosis, but if you're going to support that individual as a whole, what you do need is to see their profile. So what have we chosen? That actually the, the rule is overlap is the rule rather than the exception. But we do still like those boxes. They make us feel comfortable. So what I want to talk to you a little bit for the last sort of 10, 15 minutes is really thinking about how do we cope with this variability? Because if you've got 20, 30, 50, 100 people, kids working in a, a, a yacht, attending a yacht, or even a small number, how do we gather this information about the individual, and their education, and their past history, and their family relationships, and what's around in them in terms of transport, or finance, or their mental health and well-being, or all the other things that might be affecting them. How do we capture that? And I want to show you how computer-based assessments might provide a framework for the, a social model, or an ecological approach. What they can do is capture disparate information systematically from multiple sources, and across time, so they can build a picture gradually across time, and this can provide a profile of strengths and can measure progress and outcome. And it can do that in a, in a systematic and consistent manner. Because what we really need if we want person-centered planning or individual development plans or IEPs or ILPs or whatever you're calling it, because they seem to vary from place to place, is that what we need to really grasp is each individual does have a unique profile. And we talk about it and then we go back into the labels again. And if you use the International Classification of Functioning, this is the World Health Organization of Functioning, and we're thinking about looking at who this individual is, really from a, a, a holistic perspective, is that we need to see if they've got difficulties, we need to recognize what those are and their pattern are, we need to see how it affects them and their limitations on activity and participation. These are really important to look at. What are the factors in terms of where they're living, um, in the context of where they are, Oh, who's around, what are the support factors, and this building up of this picture is really crucial because it's this that can really tells us if we otherwise we're doing things to somebody when actually it could be this area or this area that could be the true factors that are really causing the challenges for that young person. So how do we identify learning difficulties and disabilities in youth offending yachts? Some will be coming on already identified in inverted commas. They may have one label or another. It may not always be the right label. It may be it's not a complete label. 
but others may have challenges that have not been identified or may have been misunderstood. This is from Jenny Talbot from the Prison Reform Trust. No one knows a document. Uh, and I thought there's quite a good quote that people with learning disabilities are not a homogenous group. They're all individuals with a ra wide range of life experiences, strengths, weaknesses, and support needs. However, many will share common characteristics which might make them especially vulnerable to enter and travel through the criminal justice system. So what technology can do is find the similarities in individuals so you can group and do work together, but also recognizes the differences, the heterogeneity between one person and another. And uh, we, we've developed a um, profiling system that gathers personal information and provides tailored assessments and surveys. And it gathers information around health issues and past education and employment, measures numeracy and literacy, looks at individuals' home life, and integrates that information in an accessible system. So again, we are not assuming that somebody can read, so everything is voiced, so it could, because otherwise uh, it, it wouldn't be right. And then we give detailed information that's made available to the individual in, some, in a meaningful way, in a contextual way for them, um, allow you to, to group that information so you can work with groups and young people together, and then at an organizational level allows you to look at monitoring and outcomes as well. It provides guidance and tailored information, such as fact sheets and videos and sound files to help support that individual, giving them a truly person-centered plan and really allows the organization and the individual to plan for the future. And I'm just going to present a little bit of the data that we've collected just to show you a little bit of this um, and how it can show differences or similarities. This is um, four data sets where we've used the profiler in um, a Scottish prisons, Welsh prisons, um, youth offending and a youth um, offending group in Ireland and one in the UK. And we captured information, I'm just showing a snapshot, because we captured information on a number of different areas. I suppose what's interesting or, or, or sad, in a sense, is that the patterns are relatively similar in all groups. And that's what that's saying to you, in a way, is that young people grow up, and um, if we capture them early, that might be really important information, and identified, perhaps, things like language and ADHD and impulsivity. And, and, and recognize some of these things early, we may be able to do a difference. And just in 750 offenders, we've now got much larger data sets, but the time when I was uh, looking at this, we, what we noticed that, that we've got to be careful about our assumptions, because when we sometimes say that individuals have dyslexia, what we need to do is tease apart about where the reading difficulties are. Because what we found that one in four of the offenders in this one cohort had left school before the age of 14, and that one in five had regularly missed school and, uh, half the time, and, and nearly a quarter had hardly ever attended school. So this is saying that, that somebody might have a reading difficulty because actually that they had not been to school and they hadn't received education. And it's difficult to tease this apart, whether that they had left school because they had, um, there were other reasons for it. And what we're showing you is that, I'm going to show you this high levels of exclusion. So had they gone because of their impulsive behavior, short temper, they got excluded, they left school, and so they weren't attending, so they didn't, weren't able to um, become able to read, or do they also have reading difficulties and receptive language problems that were compounded with their other factors as well? And then in this cohort, nearly one in four had been diagnosed as having learning difficulties. And back in 2006, when we started using uh, some of the screening tools we're now using, what we were able to look at 600 um, offenders from diff three different populations, and we were really seeing quite consistent patterns mm -hmm in the adults and the youth offending, slightly different patterns in the sex offenders. One of the things that I think is really important in some of the large data sets we've got now is that um, we've seen that in Cardiff Prison and Park Prison, where they have a youth offending um, group, that 54% in Cardiff, the young people, the adults, had been excluded while in school and 46% in Park. And in a youth offending a yacht group in Scotland, we found 90% of them had been excluded at some time. And I think this is really important that we recognize that exclusion 
we really need to be thinking about why has somebody been excluded and really thinking about whether these young people have, a, have got unrecognized speech and language, reading, dyslexia, ADHD um, difficulties as well. But often, sadly, we only look at one part and ignore the rest. And so individuals could be lost and the, their face is not recognized and they end up within the system. We need to be much sharper at really fishing if we see one area of difficulty fishing for the other difficulties as well. So what does technology allow? It allows us for changing from a lottery potentially to accuracy. It allows us to identify perhaps more accurately the pattern of strengths and difficulties, strengths as well as difficulties, which I think is really important to move individuals forward and, and allows us to do this in a consistent manner. Let me just um, talk a little bit before we um, finish this, and I'll, then I'll take some questions from you. Is that this is John? Um, he was 17 years old. He regularly missed more than 50% of school, and he left school at 13 years of age. And he hadn't really attended very regularly. He was excluded from school many times, and excluded from several schools. And he has difficulties still with reading, spelling, and his handwriting is very poor. He's got no formal qualifications um, and he's got a history of mental illness. He's already very anxious and has been depressed. Uh, he gets quite agitated and he uses cannabis as a sort of self-medication to calm himself down. Um, he gets confused and muddled when several instructions given. He finds listening to others very difficult to do. These have been picked up from the profiler and described some in, in a little bit more detail. He often intrudes others when they speak. He difficulty, gets, has difficulty keeping attention on one task at a time. He's restless and fidgety. He acts impulsively without thoughts for the consequences. He's reported this. He finds writing neatly and fast very hard to do, and he has to reread information to understand it. So who is John, and what's his profile, and which labels do you want to put on him, and which labels don't you? And how could we actually, in reality, best support him? He feels low a lot of the time, and he's got difficulties with sleeping. He's got a reading age of seven years. So unless you present information in a way that's accessible to him, so if you give him a piece of paper to read that's important, perhaps, uh, very important, he may just turn away and not even try because he knows it's very difficult for him. He also has a sister with Down syndrome that he's helped care for. And so he's very worried about getting into trouble now because he needs to help and support his mum, who's, who's a, a single mother at home as well, and he's always helped his, his sister. So this describes John, and I think it's really important that we encapsulate when we're thinking about John's, how we really think about that individual as a whole. Using the Do It Profiler with John really just tells specifically what the areas of challenge are. He's got some ADHD and dyslexia traits. He's got mental health challenges. It can tell you where his spelling and reading is a problem and what his maths help he needs with. Just saying he's got dyslexia isn't good enough because it doesn't say where we need to support him. We need to be more descriptive and more um, targeted. We, it can provide specific guidance for him and for the professionals working with him. And it gives John his own personalized resources that he can see in a video or sound files or fact sheets that he can read because they're text to speech. He can target his strengths and his interests because he's told us what sort of hobbies and interests and what motivates him and gives us a chink about what he possibly could do. And they've been delivered in an accessible format because he has difficulties reading. So we've got to really deliver this in a way that's meaningful for him. These are the sort of things that, um, the sort of things that are generated from the profiler where they produce videos and sound files and fact sheets that he can have a look at. They allow us to identify what his tipping points are so we can understand and predict why he might become anxious or angry or withdrawn. What we know is that each individual has a unique shape and 21st techno century technology probably is going to allow us to deal with the complexity, providing everybody with an individual's person-centered plan. It's not going to do the work, it's a tool like a, a good car that runs smoothly, that, that it's, it's, it's a toolkit, it's your computer. It's part of helping us to gather the information, but actually it's individuals who are working with those that, and gaining uh, relationships with and working in yachts that will really make a difference. But it helps us at least to gather information to look at that individual's shape 
and doing that in a consistent manner. Um, for more information, if you want to know about the DOIT profiler, but this link here gives you a free downloadable book that I've written around um, offenders and around um, the criminal justice system and uh, learning difficulties and disabilities. And it's got lots of reference materials if you're interested in reading a little bit more. Um, I'm happy to take some questions if you'd like to, to do so.